Guys, I took an introduction to finance, one of the core classes for the business major with Professor McKay last fall. And he's been a really amazing professor because he taught finance and like not in a theoretical way like most people do, like using the textbook, but he taught, us, he taught it to us in a really practical way so that we can make money in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's, for the last 25 years, he's been working as Bain & Company, a consulting firm based in Boston. And currently, he's an advisory partner at Bain. Wow. So, before you ask questions, can I ask a couple questions? Sure. sure. So, how many people are undergraduates? Any graduate students? A couple? Okay, good. Um, just tick around, where are you from? Israel. Israel? China. China? China. China. Korea. China. Korea. I've never been to, but uh, it's part of what we're talking about. So, the first question for you is like, what jobs in financial services require the most cultural awareness, and for which jobs is it not as important? Um, jobs in finance, there, there are two big kinds. Um, there are some that are purely analytical jobs that require some combination of you know, type of core finance skills that, that, that you get here, that you get uh, studying for things like uh, CFA exams, that uh, you get in applied mathematics or economics courses, but it, it, it's about doing quantitative financial analysis and getting the right answer. And you know the good thing about finance and the good thing about you know, quantitative analysis is that it is by its nature non-cultural. Uh, it's about uh, knowing knowing the formulas, uh, knowing how to manipulate numbers, knowing how to interpret what those numbers mean, and your <coughs> cultural skills, your language skills. You know, it's just it, it's all about the math. It's all about yeah, so it's pretty straightforward. There are a lot of jobs in finance where that is just true. And outside of perhaps some nuances between you know, accounting rules here and accounting rules in India or China are at the margin a little different. So um, if you're, if you're out here going to school in the US, you're learning US GAAP, uh, things like that. It's all good. Now, there are also a lot of jobs in finance that involve interacting and working with people. Uh, you're a stockbroker, you have clients, you're doing, you're doing uh, financial plans with them, and uh, <coughs> you are drawing from relationships that you have built with them. Um, it required more of a personal connection, it required more of a cultural connection. You still need the finance skills, of course, but people are going in, in those types of jobs to be Wanting to feel comfortable interacting at a personal level with the person who's looking out for their money, and and want to know and trust <coughs> that person is a person who is looking out for their money, um, and that does require more, at least sort of understanding if you're, you know, if you're doing that here in the United States about what, <coughs> what the cultural issues are that an American is is caring about if you're going to be working in that type of role with them. Thank sense. you so much. Okay. Um, you just mentioned that there's like a quantitative analyst and there's a qualitative yeah. analyst. Can you talk a little bit how about how the skill set required to be successful at finance has changed since the start of your career till now? I would assume that maybe the qualitative analysts have had to get better quantitative skills and maybe the quantitative skills analysts would have to have picked up on the personal skills. Yeah, it's, it's a reasonable question. So I, I, uh, uh, I entered the uh, professional world in 1983. That's when I got my Back then, the personal computer was just underway, um, but it was a brand new thing. Um, all of the technology that we take for granted today, the internet, all 
that kind of thing. She, none, none of that existed, hard as that is for you to believe and understand because she grew up with it. And a, a lot of what a financial advisor was doing in those days was providing people with information that today they can just sit it down. What is IBM stock trading for today? I used to pick up the phone and call my financial advisor and talk to him about that. <laughs> that was the only way to know that. <laughs> It is a completely different world. So a lot of the things that require human elements no longer do. Uh, I'm sure there are some people, like maybe my, you know, my grandmother's passed away now, but people like my grandmother who are still around that uh, uh, might still uh, pick up the phone and, and make the call to ask questions like that. But uh, the vast majority of people now, that, that's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, the, a lot of the, the sort of personal connection stuff used to be to provide uh, very basic information, that's gone. Now what's important is to make people feel comfortable about all the information they have and how to interpret it. So it's not just about providing information, it's about... Uh, yeah, and, and, and putting it in a broader context. Um, that, that's actually good, I think, because it's it's, it's a more interesting and sort of higher value added uh, activity. Uh, and it's still important. And, and a lot of it is also now more the emotional element. Help, helping people save and plan for their long term financial futures and how to meet their financial objectives of saving for buying a house, saving for their kids' education, saving for their retirement. And dealing with the emotional parts of. Golly, you know, the stock that we bought has just gone down by a, a ton, and I just lost money, and I'm feeling upset, and I'm feeling uh, uncertain what to do. Um, there, there's a lot more that has to be connecting with people and helping them feel comfortable that it's not just about just giving you a simple answer to a simple question. Thank you. Um, when we had spoken earlier, you mentioned that you've never worked outside of the U.S. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I've never, I mean, I, 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 and, and I've never lived outside of the U.S. <laughs> and I spent very little time outside of the U.S. and stuff. But since you worked at Bain & Company for over 25 years, yeah. would you be able to tell us how Bain operates differently in different countries? Sure. So Bain, Bain is a truly global company. Uh, it, it was founded here in the United States, it is still headquartered here in Boston, but we have 50-something offices in 40-something countries all around the world. Um, and a majority of the firm's revenues are outside of the United States. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a very sort of international and global business. Um, Um, I do business regularly with other consultants from Bain and different offices around the world. A, a significant number of our projects are set up and staffed uh, on a cross-office basis. Um, I, I worked earlier this year uh, for a company that makes packaging equipment. Um, if you <coughs> You uh, go to the store and you see a big uh, plastic container full of it, or a big you know, shipper full of these <coughs> bottles, and it would come to the store sort of stacked up uh, so high. This company makes all of this strapping equipment that you would strap around the things to make sure that the pallet bottle doesn't fall <laughs> off and, and, and make a mess. A pretty simple product, but they sell a couple billion dollars of this stuff all around the world. Well, so, pretty easy. Yeah, you know, I was just sort of thinking to find, like, okay. You never really think about companies like that, but you know, some, somebody's got to do it. They, they, they do it. They, they exist. Exactly. And, and it's a very nicely profitable business because um, uh, they, they, they help the, the Cokes and Pepsis of the world to uh, not have their product make mess everywhere and actually uh, show up looking nice in the stores. Then it's good. Um, but uh, that, that project team, we, we that, that, that business was looking to improve its uh, growth in each of the major areas that it operated. Uh, I worked with and led a team that was looking here in the US market, but we had a, a parallel team uh, working out of Germany.
Germany that was looking at the major European markets for the country. We also had a team in India that was looking at opportunities there. And as we as we together put together the overall strategy for the business and thought about the relative opportunities in the market, I mean, it's, it, yeah, it, it's a very common thing. You're, you're working with people who have their own perspectives, uh, communicate things your own ways, and, and, and part of what you have to do to work together as a team is understand those nuances and, and work together as a team to get it done. So it, it, it helps in an environment like Bain that we have very strong uh, culture and common way of doing things. All the training programs that we run, we run as global programs. So we'll bring in all of the people at each level uh, every time uh, the appropriate training program and train them together so that they all have the same perspective on how to, to do the work. Um, but there's still nuances. There's still nuances. As, 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 and, and the time zones make life a little complicated too, actually, for the four names they got. But it's okay. And you make it work. You just mentioned how there was projects in India and other countries. Yeah. Um, and I'm assuming that oh, some of the team members come from that country, but uh, I'm also assuming that some of the team members come from other countries. Can you just talk a little bit about? how maybe someone not being culturally aware or aware of the nuances, it hurt their project or hurt the company or project in some way? Um, it, it's, um, here, here's what I've observed. The typical American is pretty direct about what it is that they say when they're thinking. And if they think something needs to get done, they say, you know, I think this needs to get done. Um, in many other cultures, many Asian cultures, people are less direct and forthright. And they are especially less forthright if I'm the senior American and they're a relatively junior member and they're afraid that I might not like what they have to say and they don't say it. Or they say it in a very indirect way that if I'm not really paying attention, it would just easily go right on by. Uh, and and I, I have learned over time, particularly as I, I, particularly as I have become more senior and am therefore working on more global things and working with more junior global people, that I need to be more direct and really trying to get at what is on their mind rather than just assuming it's going to be said. That's, that, 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 yeah, from, from, from what I need to do to uh, accommodate uh, that, it's just, yeah, I, I need to do what I can. Do you kind of encourage them to be more direct or do you kind of step inside their mind and know that they're never going to really speak their mind? It, it depends on how much I work. I mean, I, I describe things as sort of a generalization, or to, to use a more negative word, stereotype. I, I just I know that on average, that's probably what I'm going to have to do. Now, if it's somebody that I that I work with for an extended period of time and I have multiple interactions, then I, I, I might try to, to get them past it. A, a lot of times, particularly in the context of a consulting project. We might have one meeting, maybe a second meeting, and then I may never work with them again. So I, I just I just go in just assuming that I'm going to have to try to get at things a little bit more, and and, and just accept that in, in terms of meeting somebody uh, part way, um, that that's part of what I need to do. But it certainly is. Uh, I'm always happy to be pleasantly surprised when I don't need to do that. But that's that, that that is part of getting along and working. Looking back on your career, okay. <laughs> looking back on your career, like, do you wish you worked outside of the U.S. and like, since you worked in the U.S. your whole life, do you think you've gained anything or lost anything by doing so? Um, <clears throat> many. I don't want to say necessarily most, but a, a, a really large number of people at Bain uh, 
have worked in other offices, have worked outside the United States uh, often for extended periods. That's actually uh, yesterday with uh, an old friend and partner of mine who has spent the last six years in Syria and is now transferred back to the U.S. after spending six years um, in Switzerland. Um, it, it's clear he got a tremendous amount out of that experience, uh, both personally and professionally. Um, I've never been much of a world traveler. Would I be a better person if I had done that? Probably. Um, <laughs> It's never really been my inclination. I, I, I have never been to Asia. I've been here maybe half a dozen times. Most of just very short trips. Which countries have you been to? Uh, in Europe. I have been to the UK. I have been to Ireland. I have been to France. I have been to Germany, Czech Republic. Oh, right. and, and, and most of those are, I had a business meeting in Zurich. I flew in, I did my meeting, I went home. I went home. <laughs> <laughs> this is more of a practical question, but on what courses or minors do you think would complement an econ or finance degree today? So, I'll go back to the things that I talked about before. Um, so, I, I have an undergraduate degree in economics and then an MBA. Um, so, very classic. Numbers guy, that's me. Um, I teach finance, what can I say? Um, the, the, the parts that I wish I had gotten more, either in my undergrad or grad education, uh, would be a psychology. Better understanding people. How, how to read people, how to influence people. Uh, and then I, I have actually also, I, I, I've always been interested in history. And me, a lot of being successful in the finance world and the investing world comes from an understanding of history. Because cycles repeat. Uh, things happen that are a lot like what they happened before. If you can recognize that, um, it helps you. Uh, Prediction. Yeah, or at a minimum, not overreact to what's happening. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I remember when I was running my fund during the financial crisis, and it's like, okay, is this really 1930, like happening all over again, or are we going to be going through you know, like a decade of just misery? It really just doesn't feel that way. Okay, so let's, let's, let's assume that while we got to be a little bit cautious, let's recognize that this is more probably just like a, a sort of bad version of a typical recession in a year or two, like it would be better than it, than it was. By not uh, panicking out at the bottom, um, the bottom. Okay. okay, so you dealt with a lot of people um, and MBA graduates from Harvard, Kellogg, mm -hmm. Babson. Um, what do you say is like unique to that IBS didn't take away from Brandeis? So I, 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 this is my sixth year here at Brandeis. Um, I, I taught uh, graduate classes uh, my first three years. And started teaching business seven months, two years ago, so it's my third year teaching now. Um, so I, I, I don't have as, as much history with the undergraduates, but I, I have some. I think part of what is unique here is the, the business school, because of its, the undergraduate business program, because of the connection to the graduate program, really is an international program. You, you have the IBS uh, student base, which is something like 75 Yes. You don't have that in any elementary school. So the, the, the faculty and the curriculum really do emphasize the international perspective. The students and the students' groups, by definition, provide an international perspective. And it's broad based in that that I think it really helps and acclimate people to a much broader uh, range of people, range of range of personal styles, um, that help succeed. And I, 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 I think as well, there is a tremendous benefit to the undergraduates from having a graduate business school right here in the same building with you, with 
having a lot of common faculty teaching both graduate and undergraduate courses. Uh, I strongly encourage uh, undergraduate students uh, who really are interested in topics to talk to professors about being in the graduate classes. Uh, generally, once you fulfill the prerequisites um, to the undergrad program, graduate professors are pretty happy to take in uh, undergraduate students and, and, and let you learn things that your, your typical uh, undergrad, and other, even if there is an undergrad in physics program, doesn't have the same access. And, and I would also say, I, I appreciate your kind words about the Physics 71 course, but there, I got my MBA at the University of Chicago, a very good school. But the classes there are all taught, or overwhelmingly taught by academic professors who are far better than I am at teaching the theory of things, but have no real world experience on how to actually make money in real work. Which is crucial. <laughs> well, um, it all depends on what you want to do. <laughs> and I think you know, um, And the, you know, my graduate classes are very much practical applied at oral finance courses. And there are a ton of people like me in, on the IBS faculty who do marketing for a job, do human resources for a job, do finance for a job, do accounting for a job. They're people who live in the real world and come and teach you IBS. Um, and taking advantage of that practical perspective, there is far more opportunity to do that here as both an undergraduate and a graduate student than you have almost anywhere else. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. So you have, you have both a truly international community you have the opportunity to learn practical, this is how you make money and do things in the real world perspectives that the average.